five years after Jean Suat founded this monastery, he went back to Thailand. And soon after his return to Thailand, he was in an automobile accident, paralyzed from the base of the spine on down, suffered lung damage, brain damage. And so his ability to give Dharma talks was severely curtailed. And so when he did give Dharma talks, either formally or informally, he realized he had to boil the message down to the most essential, most important points. And he always talked about refuge, taking the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha as refuge. I think it's useful to consider why. It's not that we're expecting the Buddha to come and help us, or that the Dharma is going to jump out of the books and help us, or the Noble Sangha will help us solve our problems. They solved their problems and they showed us how. They also showed us the values we should hold to as we go through life, because they embody these values in their actions. One of the names the Buddha used for himself was Tathagata. It has many meanings. And one of them is that he acts as he speaks, and he speaks as he acts. And so it's not just that he taught useful things, but in his actions he showed how. So as you go through life, it's always good to keep the Buddha in mind. That, that's another meaning of the Pali word for refuge, sadhana. It can also mean something you remember, something you hold in mind. Because the values of the world today are, are toxic. If you're looking for the well-being of your heart, the well-being of your mind, you need to remember their examples of other ways of living. Other ways of giving priority to what's really a value in life. As in that chant just now, the five recollections, they seem to present what was going through the Buddha's mind. When he's not yet the Buddha, when he's a Bodhisattva. On the one hand, he saw aging, illness, and death, and separation. He had a great sense of sangwega, which actually means terror, realizing that everywhere you go in life, this is what you run into, if you don't find a way out. And then the reflection on karma, that's the way out. Now, it's a warning as well. That reflection is meant to give rise to heedfulness. Because our actions really do make a difference. The choices you make make a difference. But the teaching on karma is also a, a source of confidence. That it is within your power to find true happiness. You don't have to settle for second, third, or fourth best. And so you have to be very careful about your actions, what you do, what you say, what you think. This is why we train the mind. So that we don't forget what are the standards for skillful actions. And why do we forget? We get provoked. As the Johns in Thailand noted, people in the West are really weak in two areas, endurance and equanimity. 
endurance, not being able to stand harsh words, not being able to stand pain, unpleasant sensations. Equanimity, the ability to maintain your mind on an even keel, no matter what happens, good or bad. When you're on an even keel, you see things evenly. And it's a lot easier to do the right thing. But if you let your emotions get in the way, you fall into forms of bias. It's interesting, the Thai word for bias, lam yang, is derived from the word for leaning. You're leaning in directions of being unfair because you like somebody, or because you hate somebody, or because you're deluded, or because you're afraid of somebody. If the mind can't maintain its evenness, it leans in these directions, and then topples over into bad directions. So think of the Buddha and his endurance. Think of the Buddha and his equanimity. That story he tells of Prince Tikawu, whose parents were killed by the king. So first he swears revenge. He works his way into the, into the palace, works his way into the king's confidence, and finally gets in a position where he could kill the king. But his father had told him, don't look too far, don't look too close. Animosity is not stilled by animosity. Animosity is stilled by non-animosity. And so he refrained from killing the king. He showed the king that he was in a position where he could kill him. The king begged for his life. But Prince Tikawu said, no, you give me my life. So they swore, each, swore that they would protect each other and not harm each other. And the story ended well. If Tikawu had gone ahead and killed the king, then Tikawu would have gotten killed, and who knows what would have killed the people who killed the killed Tikawu. These things just go on and on and on in links of a chain, and they bind you. You free yourself when you cut the link. So you look around. There are a lot of things that are really provoking in our society, but you have to remember, the society is not the gauge of what's important and what's not. It's your knowledge of the Dharma. The fact that you've taken refuge means that you have a different set of values. And so in a society that does not value endurance and does not value equanimity, you've got to develop those qualities and keep reminding yourself of their importance. And it helps to think of the examples of the Buddha, the examples of the Ajans. You read about them enduring the heat, you read about them in sitting through pain. And it's not that they were born less sensitive to the pain than we are. Simply, they were inspired by the example of the Buddha, inspired by the example of the great noble disciples of the past. And the fact that they were inspired is what kept these values alive. It's that connection of the heart. You see somebody doing something really honorable, and something inside you says, yes, I want to be able to do that too. And no matter how many centuries ago it was, it doesn't matter. There's a connection. Something is transferred across time. And the values are kept alive. Well, the Ajans did that. We can do that here, too.
be inspired by their examples, and decide that it doesn't matter that they were over in another part of the world in another time, decades ago. In the case of the Buddha, centuries ago, the values are still good, the values that they represent, the values that they embody. So always keep them in mind. Remember that dual meaning of the word sarana, something you take refuge in, something you keep in mind. So that wherever you go, it's as if you have the Buddha inside you, the Dharma and the Sangha are inside you. Years back when we were st starting Wat Metta, we get people coming up here telling us, well, now that you're in America, you have to change the rules, you have to change the way you do things. And my thinking was, here I am far away from my teachers, far away from the place I was trained. If I abandon my training, I have nothing. If I hold to the training, it's as if I'm near to them. In the same way when you hold to the example of the Buddha, and you're inspired by his example, you're near to him. The same way that you're near to the Dharma, the near to the near to the Sangha. So wherever you go, you're not alone. You've got a good set of values inside. And regardless of the values outside, When you stick to the values of the Triple Gem, you're secure, you're safe. This is why they're called a refuge. Because one of the worst things that can happen to you is if, if you let the values of the world insinuate themselves into your mind, and you start doing things and saying things and thinking things that are going to be for your long-term detriment. When you keep the Buddha in mind, the Dharma in mind, the Sangha in mind, they protect you from that danger. And when you learn how to embody their qualities, the protection gets even more secure.